Good morning and welcome to Safe Workers Australia's virtual seminar series. I'd like to welcome those of us uh, you who are present today and those who will be listening online. I'm Peter Miller and today I'm going to be facilitating today's discussion. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional lands of the Kaurna people and I pay my respects to them, their elders, past, present and future. Today we're going to explore some really interesting areas around workplace bullying and how to design a bullying-free workplace. We all know, and are, because we work in this field and are familiar with the definition of workplace bullying, which is repeated and unreasonable behaviour directed to a worker or a group of workers and that creates a risk for health and safety. On the slides that we've been having during our introduction, uh, are some of the data that some of us are familiar with that sh remind us that workplace bullying remains a serious problem in Australia's workplaces and something we must do something about. It has huge financial and human consequences. Our panel today are experts and well respected in their fields and I'm not going to do justice by um, talking their full biography with you today so I'm going to do a brief introduction and uh, suggest that if you'd like to know more about them, go on to our website. Firstly, it's my great pleasure to introduce Commissioner Peter Hampton from Fair Work Australia. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Hampton was appointed to Fair Work Australia in 2010, where he also is the head of the anti-bullying panel. He has a Bachelor in Business and majored in Personnel and Industrial Relations, and prior to that, worked as Director of Policy and Strategy for Safe Work SA. And I'm very pleased to introduce our, our next guest, Bernadette Nicole Butler, who is a health and safety expert who's come down from Queensland to help us out today. Bernadette is uh, currently Manager of Leadership and Culture at Workplace Health and Safety in Queensland and previously was the Chief Policy Officer for Safe Work SA. And finally, but not least, uh, Michelle. Michelle's the Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of South Australia. And Michelle is a leading thinker in this field, and I'm sure that all three of our speakers today are going to give us some really useful insights into um, workplace bullying. So, Bernadette and Peter, could I just ask you first, Peter, and then Bernadette, to start, what are we talking about uh, when we're talking about workplace bullying? Perhaps you could give some common examples from your experience as a Fair Work Commissioner, and Bernadette, from your experience with the regulator. In terms of um, anti-bullying applications that the Commission deals with, then we were exposed to a whole range of workplaces and scenarios. But what we certainly see is that where there are bullying allegations in place, or particularly where there's bullying conduct that's present, what you do see is an organisation that's sort of distracted from its main focus. In other words, we probably all understand the impact that bullying conduct has on the individual, but what's often not understood is the impact that bullying conduct has on other people in the workplace and the workplace itself. So, so for instance, what, what we do see is organisations distracted from what they need to be doing. We see the poor productivity, we see absenteeism, we see a lot of dysfunctional workplaces. And the, I suspect the reason for that is that the bullying conduct doesn't occur in isolation. It generally occurs in the context of a whole culture. Uh, and so when later on we talk about some of the solutions to that, we need to, of course, look at the organisational context and culture and, and some of those infrastructure things because uh, that's ultimately um, how these matters are dealt with and prevented appropriately. So even though it's played out through dysfunctional interpersonal relationships, there's bigger things happening in the organisation behind the yes. scenes? Not always, but, but almost always. Right. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And yeah. Bernadette? Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree. You know, if we if we look at the workplace culture outside of just individual behaviours, because individual behaviours, even when you look at them, you may just be working on what you see as an impact between two people, when in actual fact it is often supported by uh, an organisational culture, as Peter said, that's not hasn't got their eye on the ball for that, but also it doesn't account for the harm that's caused to people that work around them their families and many other people and the organisation as a whole. So productivity, loss, loss of business, um, impact on their reputation. So there are impacts that are really broad. And I think in terms of what you would see as a bullying, you know, how people 
would see bullying and may make a complaint against bullying really ranges from anything where a person may feel that they've been isolated from particular meetings or work, that they have been treated unfairly and consistently because as you see the definition will come up at some stage where it's repeated and unreasonable behaviour, it's not reasonable management action, right through to what is really common assault. So, you know, in some circumstances, those bullying experiences really are matters for the police versus uh, either the Fair Work Commission or, or Work Health and Safety Regulators. So the examples can, in terms of bullying, can go from assault through to disrespectful behaviour that's repeated and yes. undermining people. Yeah. So, Michelle, you're an international researcher in this space. Um, as one of the opening slides, we had some of the data about the prevalence in Australia. Is Australia worse, better, the same as over similar OECD countries? So the prevalence rate for workplace bullying in Australia, based on the most recent data, is 9.4%. And if we look at the comparative data, um, particularly with Europe, that would actually place us six out of the 34 EU countries. So I'd regard that as, you know, solid evidence that the bullying prevalence rate in Australia is pretty high. But, you know, one thing that might surprise people in this field is that we see bullying across a whole range of industries. So bullying amongst staff members, which is what we're talking about here, um, we can find that between prison officers, we can find that in hospitals, between nurses, between doctors, we can find that in schools, between school teachers, we find it in the government, we find it in the private sector. So it really is a broad phenomenon cutting across all Australian industries. There are some industries that are a little bit more at risk than others. Um, women tend to report higher exposures to bullying than do men. Women also feature more highly in bullying complaints uh, that might come to regulators. Um, I'm not sure if that's also true of the Fair Work Commission. Uh, and, and there are some pockets of industries that are consistently high risk whenever we look at the data in Australia or internationally. There are things like healthcare, uh, community services, government administration, um, sometimes education. Right now though, kind of a, a high risk industry is the energy sector where we've seen a lot of change in Australia and they've really increased in the bullying prevalence um, over the last five or so years. So I guess that was to all of you, um, uh, uh, and it, that leads to the point is the, this particular, you're saying it's across all sectors, but there are some sectors that are vulnerable. Mm. Are there particular individuals who are more vulnerable? So what are the characteristics of the people who, who are experiencing um, being, being bullied? Or perhaps those people who, the characteristics of those who might be potentially sources of that undesirable behaviour? To, and I ask this to all of you. Well, look, from my perspective, I think that's a very difficult question. My experience both uh, in the work health and safety setting and also as part of the Fair Work Commission is, is that there are very few common characteristics. Um, the, the reality is that a bullying conduct um, is partly, uh, it's a question of the perception of the person who, who has an expe expectation about the way they'll be treated um, uh, in terms of the, the individuals named or the persons that are uh, expected that are on the receiving end of, a, in our case, an application. There are no particular single characteristics and, and, um, and uh, indeed, I mean, that's, that's natural human behaviour is that p people will have different expectations about the way they conduct themselves, the way they treat with people, and that's, that's, that's what we're dealing with. What's important, I think, is, that, um, is not to spend too much time concentrating on the, on the individuals, but, but concentrating on the context in which conduct mm -hmm. occurs. Mm -hmm. It always has a, a conduct and like every work health and safety um, has it and, and bullying is another one of those. It's a question of systematic approach. It accepts that individuals are different. They have different tolerances, they have different expectations but the system needs to, design, to be designed to cope with that. So if you look at a system whereby you say let's look at a manual uh, hazard that you know in a sense Everyone would accept that you design a system accepting that individuals are different, they're mm -hmm. built differently, they do things um, differently. Sometimes they do stupid things. Sometimes they don't act appropriately or rationally. 
but, but we design those manual systems that accepts that people are different. We need to take the same approach to the design of anti-bullying approaches, accepting that people are different, different tolerances, different approaches, different expectations. We need systems that are, accept that, that we're dealing with humans and, and human beings. They have a degree of tolerance for difference. Yeah, and, um, and so it w would seem to me that um, I think any sort of study into the characteristics of people that make complaints or put in our case put in applications or those that are on the receiving end of those applications. But what, whilst that might be interesting from my, from my point of view, I, I think that would be a distraction from the, from the main game. So the point that you're making is that there, it's, it's seated within an organisation. So Bernadette and Michelle, so there's some organisational factors that kind of give us some signs that uh, organisations may be more or less likely to have bullying complaints arise? Yeah, I'd like to Michelle. respond to that and respond to what um, the Commissioner has said. So there has been some research into the individual factors that might be associated with people experiencing bullying or not. But overwhelmingly what we see when we look across all of the scientific studies all around the world we see it is the work-related factors. We see that bullying arises as a product of the functioning of the organisational system. Mm. So if the organisation is functioning really well, we don't see much bu bullying. But if it's not functioning so well, and particularly in certain key areas, then we see bullying arise, we see absenteeism arise, we see low productivity, we see a whole range of effects. So the focus um, really should be on understanding how the system is functioning, where it's not functioning so well, and building that resilient system to support resilient workers. And to add to that, you know, when we, when we look at the legislation, particularly for around work health and safety, we are expected to implement safe systems of work. So it really goes to what does that look like in an organisation? And every organisation will be slightly different. Every, every team will be slightly different and every industry has differences that need to be accounted for. And so no one size fits all. So if we look at those organisational factors, it could be that, and even people, for example, we, when you assess psychological risk, you might look at uh, job control, you might look at overload, you know, what, what's the work look like and, and what kind of work is it? Different people work differently with different workloads. For example, um, I love challenging complex work. That's, that's my sort of sweet spot. If I have one thing to do, I may struggle over time because I will, not, I will feel like that's not enough. It's not challenging. I need more to do. Whereas other people have different needs in their workplace. And, and really, I think when you're looking at a WHS system, as Peter said, you're looking at physical hazards, the requirement is under the legislation to consult with the workers. If you ask the workers, you know, what are the hazards, it, it does a couple of things. It helps them identify the hazards. What are the peculiarities for your particular workspace? But it also helps them have some ownership about what that might look like. And the same can be done around implementing safe systems of work around psychological risk to reduce bullying. So you mentioned a couple of um, factors there I'd just like to touch base on it with respect to the research. So, what the research shows is that um, the work is really fast paced, so there's too much work to do and too little time. If workers don't have a lot of control over when and how they do their work, that's a risk factor for bullying. Yeah. Red tape, you know, too many layers of approval, uh, too many work constraints, like, you know, with getting things done in a timely way, again, that's a risk factor for bullying. Perhaps the most, uh, the biggest risk factor in terms of the evidence is actually what's called role ambiguity. So that's when the boundaries of the role aren't clear and people can be allocated all sorts of work tasks and asked to do all sorts of different things that may not really be legitimate or appropriate for their role. And we see this consistently coming out in the bullying research. Is that something, the lack of role clarity that you've seen, Peter, in your experience? Uh, absolutely. Look. A reasonable proportion of the matters that the Fair Work Commission deals with in the anti-bullying area arise in the context of either workplace change or mm. disciplinary or performance management. Now, anyone working this field would understand why that occurs. But, but what's interesting is that the, a, a subset associated with that is not just the different perceptions as to what you know, reasonable management action is as against unreasonable action, but this idea about role <coughs> ambiguity, and in particular, um, 
workers or managers not actually understanding their role properly, understanding the parameters, and they don't understand therefore what they're being measured against or what the managers are not quite clear exactly what they're measuring. So our practical experience absolutely coincides with that, um, with that research. Yes, I'd agree. We, um, in Queensland and across jurisdictions, we've, there's uh, a people at work tool, which is a psychosocial risk assessment tool, and it does measure role ambiguity, role conflict, uh, autonomy and the supports that, when balanced out, um, really lead to a psychologically healthy and safe workplace. When there's an imbalance, it leads to an unsafe workplace and therefore those factors can then lead to or can result in bullying. And sometimes uh, when you have managers who are put in positions to manage teams who don't have the right skill set and then don't really understand not just their own roles, but how to then work with the people they're managing or supervising, that really has the potential to escalate minor problems into bullying. Yeah, managers play an absolutely key role. So we analysed 342 bullying complaints that were lodged with um, the local health and safety regulator here, Safe Work SA. We found that across all of those bullying complaints, it's really coming down to the way that managers are performing their role in three key areas. So how the working hours are administrated and coordinated, so rosters and schedules and leave and things like Whether that. Whether they're perceived as fair. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Is it fair? Is there input into the process? Um, and particularly fairness across the whole work group, not just singling one person out. Performance management, as the Commissioner mentioned, is the second domain and that's taking up around 80% of those complaints, everything from role clarity to how tasks and, and workloads are allocated and managed, uh, right through to the issues of underperformance, which are around 40% of those complaints. And the third area is how managers go about building the relationships with individual workers, with the team, um, and also generally in terms of work health and safety, are they leading the way in terms of a, a healthy and a safe uh, work environment. So there's a fairly consistent message I'm hearing here about organisational factors but also management style mm -hmm. and communication between workers. Um, I'm hearing quite a lot about uh, managers and um, the people they supervise uh, problems in their relationship but what about worker to worker um, complaints of bullying? Is that something that you see a lot of or is it more manager to um, manager to worker relationships? Because of the definition of bullying that we've discussed already, there is no need for a sort of a power relationship to, to be present. But, but, it, but it, is, it is fair to say the majority of applications the Fair Work Commission deals with do involve um, workers, that is, um, or employees in the traditional sense, and secondly, in terms of the individuals named overwhelmingly they are people in supervisory or management positions. So whilst it isn't part of the definition that they are the nature of applications that are being brought to the Commission. That doesn't of course mean that that is the only context in which either we deal with matters or that bullying occurs in mm -hmm. workplaces but that's the nevertheless the sort of sample that, that end up coming to the Commission. What's in, in, important about, about that I think is that we do see examples where uh, all of the infrastructure is in place, and this is particularly an issue for, for a larger workplace. All the policies, the strategies and the training, the reporting systems are in place. But particularly for larger organisations where they have branch offices or regional locations, um, you often find that there are sort of practices and approaches taken um, in, the, in the context of you know, performance management or workplace change where the, in a sense, the, the policy is certainly not applied in a, in a practical sense and so the local management don't follow the script and don't follow the, the, the approach. And so it's back to Michelle's point about sort of, um, uh, inconsistent and unfair application yeah, of, yes, of procedures. Yes. And that's probably because, and look, look, management is one of the hardest jobs in the world. It is a really hard job and anyone that sits in a position like mine uh, uh, I've, I've been in that role, I understand how, how difficult that is, so uh, I'm, not, I'm not sort of critical of management per se, I understand it's inc it is an incredibly difficult job. But one of the responsibilities is to manage people and to take care of people and to, and to set up an appropriate culture in the workplace. So the example I'm giving is a result of the organisations that have the right 
infrastructure, but they don't live and breathe it. In other words, they don't drive it down through the through through the uh, through the organisation, so that it sort of becomes part of the culture. And uh, look for those of us that have been involved with work health and safety over some years will probably, if we recall, 30 years ago or so, when so we, we really got serious in this country about work health and safety. You go into an organisation, and exactly the same dynamics would appear in terms of, sort of those sort of manual, sort of. Um, Based, based hazards, so they sort of put in place policies, but they didn't really apply them. And you could go into a workplace and you'd know that this was not an organisation that actually sort of Took lived and breathed them. Mm. Whereas if you go into a lot of workplaces, you know, manufacturing workplaces now, you know that they actually do take this really seriously. Yeah. And every step of the process, they take these risks seriously and they don't just go through the motions. Well, I think in, in, in Australia, and in other countries, we're only, in a sense, learning to do that with hazards associated with the management of people. Um, but we're, we're, we're on that journey. We've started, and we're, you know, research and, and practical experience is starting to contribute to that. Um, so that I think, uh, hopefully, in years to come, we'll see, well, look, yes, this is, you can go into an organisation and say, this is an organisation that actually takes these things seriously. The policies, procedures, approaches, and attitudes are actually hardwired into the organisation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, managers have a lot of discretion in how they implement the policies. And so in a large organisation with multiple sites, we have um, situations like this emerge. But I might just flip this for a minute and talk about, well, what's the positive side of that? And in our research, what we've found is if workers feel really safe to voice out to their manager, and their manager uh, does uh, takes personal responsibility for addressing the bullying situation, then we can have a really good result. It can escalate and it can de-escalate really quickly. So workers need to feel safe, that they've got someone to talk to, and that that person can have a meaningful impact on the situation. And in the case of managers who do take that really seriously, we can resolve things early on in the piece, which I think is really the only solution for bullying. Absolutely, we should focus on prevention <laughs> and then on early intervention, because after that it becomes really difficult to, um, to get a good outcome. Yes, and I'd agree. With, with bullying, by the time a bullying complaint or notification comes through or an application, a lot of damage has already been done. People are on both sides and around psychologically damaged more often than not. And I think if we can pull it upstream to leaders, if leaders of organisations are leading and demonstrating that they're really clear and serious about a particular system. I use an example many, many times where you would not tolerate, none of us in this room would tolerate an unguarded saw going mm. like, a, like a tree saw in the doorway. We just would not go near it. And yet, too often, we walk past appalling systems, appalling behaviours, and we don't do anything. And I think if we can, if every person in an organisation, now you don't have to be a manager to be a leader in an organisation, if every person in a leadership role can take a stand to what good systems and good practices look like because some of us have a responsibility to speak up because others might not be able to. You may have young workers who don't have the experience or confidence to speak up about systems and that's psychological um, risk in the workplace. If they don't speak up, then those of us who can should. And I think if we can work as much upstream as possible, then we prevent any of those. And some of that is managing the psychosocial risks. So you're there very clear. We, we've got so much research behind the systems and the assessment tools that say, if you do these things, then you will reduce the psychological risk in your workplace. That's very clear. So and, our theme today is around designing out bullying. So I'm hearing a series of messages coming through. Peter, you were focusing a lot on management behaviour. I'm also hearing some messages about having the policies and procedures. And Michelle, you started to introduce the idea about some of the antecedents, the precursors like um, workload stress. I'm mm. wondering if we can delve down a little bit more about are there particular um, uh, aspects of the work design that we should be focusing on to uh, design it out and how do we do that? So what we've continued after I spoke about analysing 342 bullying complaints and that really revealed the risk pockets in organisation. 
we've actually translated those risk pockets into a risk assessment tool. And so this risk assessment tool is focused at understanding those areas of the organisation that aren't functioning mm -hmm. well. Um, it's got a really good evidence base behind it. We can discriminate between high, medium and low risk teams for a whole range of work health and safety outcomes. But it comes down to 11 core job activities, as I mentioned, right from rostering and scheduling through to the way that the work unit is led and the relationships with individuals, managing the tasks and workload, managing underperformance and so on. So they, they would align really well with those broader psychosocial assessment tools that you talked about, Bernie, that assess demands and mm. control. So we can have a multi-layered approach. So the tools are there. We can do evidence-based risk assessment for psychosocial hazards in the workplace that can feed into risk control strategies. How, how's that information gathered? Is it surveys? Is it, um, how, how do you find out what people are actually thinking is going on in that workplace? Our particular tool is what's called a behaviourally anchored rating scale. So it's like a survey, but it's a graphical tool in a traffic light style. So we have red, uh, yellow and green zones. So it's really easy to use, but surveys are another approach. So, Bernie, you mentioned the people at work yes. tool. So, so the people at work risk assessment, psychosocial risk assessment tool, it's available on the uh, Work Health and Safety Queensland website. It was developed a number of years ago and it's freely available at the moment. It's, you can download forms and teams can do the particular assessment. It's more suitable to businesses that have got at least 20 employees, but you could do it in a different way as a focus group for teams with less than, just to have the conversations. Uh, it's freely available. We're at the moment developing it as a digital tool to make it a little bit easier for people to use. So, Peter, you don't use surveys, do you? And how do you collect? Uh, how do you investigate the concerns that are brought to you? Yeah. Well, look, the Fur Commission is a tribunal, so we're not a regulator. We don't do investigations. We don't. We don't sort of do research. Although our approach to managing anti-bullying applications and our approach to um, to dealing with them recommendations we might make or orders we might issue are informed by exactly the sort of research that you've just heard about. So um, what we do is we deal with applications as a tribunal. In other words, we are required to provide natural justice and to, and to, and to, to hear an application, not, not investigate a complaint. So with all of that um, comes with that, um, we, we generally um, try and have early interventions, and in particular through more informal processes. And the reason for that is that our, look, our experience is that the earlier and more informally matters like this can be resolved, the higher the probability that there'll be a working relationship left at the end of the process. Right. And, and uh, the whole objective of the Fair Work Commission's role here uh, is to uh, make orders or, or, come, or bring about preventative approaches. So it's all about prevention. We do look backwards. In other words, we do have to make findings about whether or not there has been repeat and unreasonable conduct that creates a risk to health and safety. But we only do that to find our jurisdiction, if you don't mind the legal term. So we have to find our jurisdiction. But, but the reason we do that is only so we can look forward. Because what we need to do is actually look forward and say, well, is there a future risk of uh, repeated unreasonable conduct, then what are the sort of preventative strategies and approaches that already put in place? And so what are the preventative strategies that you recommend? Right. Well, either by recommendation or orders. Look, the Commission's approach has been firstly to recognise that uh, there are some, in a sense, some immediate issues. There are likely to be some immediate behaviours that are brought about in application. So let's assume that the Commission considers or it's agreed that there, there has been unreasonable conduct, then the first thing to do is, is to, in a sense, deal with the conduct. But secondly, and much more importantly, to recognise, as I said earlier, this all occurs in a particular context. So it's all, about, it's all about infrastructure. It's all about making sure the policy settings are right, the training is right, uh, the relationships are right, the role definitions are right, depending on, of course, what it is that, in the particular context that arises. One of the challenges, of course, is, is to have... Um, in a, appropriate grievance procedures and, and in a sense everyone, every organisation who wants to deal in this area needs to have a proper formal grievance process but, but, but my experience and the experience of other members has been that ironically um, what's important as part of this process is that there almost needs to be permission given from the top for individuals that feel that they're being bullied to raise matters informally and raise them earlier. Mm -hmm. the, the, because the moment a formal complaint is made, it has particular consequences mm -hmm. 
for the individual, for the organisation, and for the person that's named. And in, in a lot of occasions, that's appropriate because the, the behaviour is considered to be so serious it needs to be dealt with formally so it can be properly investigated, etc. But, but there's a whole class of, uh, of behaviour that if, if it was actually de dealt with earlier and more informally, the, the results are going to be much better, much better for... Uh, workers much better for the individuals uh, uh, who, who would otherwise be seen as the people conducting the conduct and better for organisations. So uh, it's hard, look, it's really hard to sort of hardwire that into a policy. You can have it there. I'm actually talking about the culture of the workplace mm -hmm. that, that accepts that it's not the end of the world if a worker has concerns about the way they're being treated and they need to be able to raise that in a way that doesn't sort of polarise parties. I accept it's hard to write that down, but when you see it, when you see it in practice, you will recognise it. Mm. And Michelle and Bernie, so he, we're hearing Peter's message that early interventions are key, but also de-escalating things early and, and opening up conversations in workplaces. What's Absolutely. Um, I couldn't agree with more with what the Commission has said. Once it becomes too far escalated, it's really difficult to de-escalate it and there's good kind of qualitative case study research that will support that. Uh, we've talked already about the need to feel safe to voice out. So having a culture that allows people to speak up um, is really important. Otherwise, it just goes underground um, and then there's, we don't see it until it becomes too far gone to, to kind of resolve. But it really does go back to the culture. It goes back to... Uh, people speaking up or other people speaking up on their behalf. It goes to people being able to have really tough conversations early on to send the right signals. But what we haven't really wanted towards is, is this prevention idea. Mm. So this is already talking about little things that are bubbling up and getting bigger, but we need to go right back to that prevention stage. Organisations need to actually assess the risk for bullying in their organisation. They need to assess the way work's designed, how demanding it is, how much control there is. They need to use the tools available so that they can actually change the work situation. And then if we've got this resilient work situation, we can have little conflicts and things bubble up mm -hmm. and they can be resolved without escalating into ongoing bullying. So prevention is absolutely the number one message and that prevention has to be assessed and targeted at those organisational factors. Yes, I'd agree. We, you know, if we can prevent bullying and we, it, uh, for me it always comes back to the legislation requires safe systems of work. Not that we're, it's about compliance with the legislation, but we know, as Commissioner said before, that with physical hazards, we've, we've really grown over the last couple of decades about how we identify, how we mitigate the risk, how we then review and we improve. So that the legislation is structured like that, most occupational work health and safety legislation. So if we consider the uh, psycho psychological risks in a workplace in the same way, we can have those conversations because the legislation also requires communication and consultation. Mm -hmm. So if we think about it from a prevention perspective, we want to identify and then uh, mitigate risk we talk to our teams, we talk to workplaces, talk to each other and then set up the systems that works because it's not enough to just have a system. It has to be one that works. And then if we can do that and then there is an issue and then something crops out that we may not have identified, it comes into, okay, well, what's the review? How do we, what's the process that we've put in place that allows people to say, actually, this doesn't quite work? So therefore, what's our process for reviewing that having those conversations again and implementing more effective controls. To just ground this back into the law, so you, you get let off the hook for a moment and I uh, turn to my other two experts. So Peter and then Bernadette, would you mind just uh, clearly articulating what does the law say in this in both those two um, jurisdictions? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll start with the Fair Work Commission and its predecessors has been dealing with with uh, alleged bullying circumstances, probably its entire existence. Um, and when was it set up? Oh, well over 100 years ago. Um, so it's it's a very long-standing tribunals have different names and different remits, but but effectively it's the same 
tribunal from reconciliation and arbitration mm -hmm. the court of the, the early 1900s. But what we now describe as bullying behaviour has been a feature of, of, of unfair dismissals and grievances and other issues for many years. In 2014, the, the Federal Act was amended to give the Commission what I would describe as a preventative uh, anti-bullying jurisdiction. Um, and so what that involves is a, the definition of bullying, which I've talked about a number of times. It allows an applicant worker uh, to bring a claim if they genuinely believe that they have been subject to, to bullying conduct in a workplace, either directed to themselves or a group of workers to which they belong. So that's the sort of the fundamental basis of the jurisdiction, but that involves claims about behaviour by individuals, either one or more individuals in a workplace. Those individuals need not be workers, that is the applicant has to be a worker as an employee or a contractor or otherwise you know, in, the, in the workforce, but the individuals that are claimed to have committed the unreasonable conduct, they are individuals. In other words, they, are, they just need to be people, individual people. So generally in our experience they are workers or other people in the workplace, but they may not be. They may in fact be visitors to the workplace, they may be contractors, they may be clients, they may mm -hmm. be um, in a residential care facility, they might be the partner or other relative of, of a client. Um, and if they conduct themselves in a repeatedly unreasonable uh, uh, context, then that could be the basis for an application. So it's a very wide remit indeed, although the majority of matters we've dealt with are employees, in more traditional work workplaces. Our job is to try and get those matters resolved uh, in a preventative context, that is trying to preserve the employment and contractual relationship uh, and potentially to make orders to do so. So it's an entirely preventative jurisdiction. We don't award compensation, we don't make findings of guilt or otherwise, we don't lock people up. What we do is we try and preserve and maintain or make safer uh, ongoing workplace relationships. So that, that's, the, that's the remit of the Fair Work so, Commission. Um, it, very precise, but also reasonably um, restrained. Whereas health and safety laws across Australia, how do they deal with this issue? Well, the health and safety laws, the definition of bullying is the same as what's used in the Fair Work Act. So repeated and unreasonable behaviour that's going to present a risk to health and safety. So in, the, in most work health and safety legislation across Australia, even though it's not all WHS, it's consistent, particularly the WHS legislation, there is uh, an obligation for uh, a person conducting a business or undertaking to protect the health and safety of workers. Now, health is defined in the WHS legislation as physical and psychological. So that's where bullying sits. It sits as a psychological risk. And business owners, uh, persons conducting a business or undertaking, have that responsibility to make sure. But also workers have a responsibility that they, by their acts or omissions, don't impact others. And other people who come into a workplace, for example, other contractors or visitors, also have a responsibility. It's just not something that we've done as well as we should, and we're not as as a community, as comfortable working through psychological risks, which include bullying behaviours, as we are with managing physical risks. My observation is, and I'm sure across the panel would see, that more and more we are asked by businesses, yes, but what can we do? We, we know that this is a really important issue. We know that we don't want to psychologically injure our workers, and we don't want them injuring each other. So what do we do and what can we do as the first steps? I might respond to that question actually. So we, bullying plays out amongst people in organisations, but it really arises from the organisational system. That's pretty clear from this morning's discussion. So we, we might work on how managers behave towards their workers. We might work on how workers interpret their role and, and their behaviour in relation to that. But that's still leaving the solutions at the behavioural mm -hmm. level. So in addition to how workers interpret things and behave and how managers act in, in relation to their role, we need to look at the system factors. So that might be, what is the actual supervision structure? Is it whoever's most senior on the day? Or are there nominated teams that have good high quality supervision? We could look at the performance management system itself. 
So that could be really important in shaping performance expectations mm -hmm. and giving people really timely feedback. Role clarity. Um, role clarity, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And if there is a performance problem, in managing that in a fair and consistent way so that the worker knows what they're doing wrong and how to improve and is given a reasonable chance and support to do that. So there's a whole range of things we can do with, with these organisational systems and structures. I'd really like to see what happens if we have an organisation that rewards both performance against budget and other operational objectives, but behaviour as well. What, ha what would happen if we were rewarded behaviour and conduct equally with those other productivity objectives? That would really send a strong signal that the way people behave around here is really important. So we need to map up the supervisor behaviour employee behaviour with these structural aspects of the system if we're going to have effective, sustainable bullying prevention. Through today's discussion, all of you at some level have touched on the issue of performance management. And Peter, I think you mentioned that it's a common um, precursor to complaints that come to you. Is being bullied because you're a poor performer or does it lead to a poor performer? What's the evidence saying? What, what are you finding in practice? Uh, look, that's a really difficult question. Can I say a bit of column A and a bit of column B? Look, mm. in reality, it's both. It's both. There would be li little doubt based on research and I think our collective experience that if a worker considers, genuinely considers that they're being treated differently or being uh, subject to unreasonable conduct, uh, then they're not likely to be uh, concentrating on the main game, they're likely to be distracted, they're likely to be uh, absent from work more often than they would otherwise be, so that will, that will lead to performance issues and then there'll be a performance management process. And if you already consider that you're subject of unreasonable treatment, that'll uh, at least in part shape your particular lens, you'll look at everything through that lens and then in a sense it's a, a self-fulfilling proposition. So that's true. But look, it, it is also true that allegations of bullying are made in the context where there is reasonable performance management being conducted. That is, uh, mm -hmm. some uh, workers' perception is that they don't like negative feedback, they don't like being told how to do something or when to do something. Um, and so it's in that context that allegations are made. So it, 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 look, it, it, it is a bit of both. I'm hearing something there is um, we've all been um, we all have performance agreements, we all have to deliver at work. So something about how performance management process is done, is that right? How the, how the messages are provided to the worker? Absolutely, that's a key risk area for workplace bullying is the performance, the formal performance management process. So we might have a performance development framework which is setting expectations and having a review and allowing people to grow and develop. But when we turn to this formal performance management for underperformance, yeah, the way that that process is stepped out, sometimes um, people perceive that as being used to bully against them. Um, and sometimes there is reasonable performance management being conducted, um, which nevertheless coincides with a bullying complaint. But the way that plays out is, is a high risk area for the perception of bullying. And I think I read in your research, Michelle, that a surprising number of places don't even have performance agreements in the first place. So how would workers know what a performance standard is yeah, it, if that, they don't have a performance agreement? That creates a big risk and, as we've talked about, role ambiguity can emerge from that, um, that risk and lack of feedback and so on. It's just creating this big risk area for bullying. So it's definitely something to have in place. It has to be really clear for workers. It has to be... Um, charge really fairly by managers um, and giving feedback to people is not actually a really easy skill so that's a, a good area mm. for training to support supervisors so in a way managers are getting a little bit of a heat here in this conversation but organizations really need to be able to support their managers to do their job well providing the right resources such as the frameworks and providing the right kind of training like how to have difficult conversations how to give really good feedback and I think um, those sometimes are the ingredients that are missing in organisations. I just want to briefly turn to the role of the person who's witnessing this going on and if they have some duties, if, if I'm in a workplace and I'm seeing bullying going on, do I have some duties to report it, to do something about it? Yes, I, I believe they do because under the work health and safety legislation uh, and consistent legislation across Australia, workers have obligations to, for the health and safety of themselves and by their acts and omissions for other workers and others. 
So I think that as observers, um, we have a responsibility, and as I said before, particularly when we know that the other person may be a more vulnerable person in a workplace. They might be a younger worker, they may be a new worker, uh, they might be someone who, who's inexperienced either in the industry or where their language skills are slightly different to the norm. And therefore, that might add a layer of vulnerability that might not be the case for some of the rest of us. And also, some people are just not confident. So therefore, I believe that as bystanders, uh, we do have an obligation to, to step in and identify, as we would for any physical hazard. If we saw a physical hazard that presented a risk to health and safety, we have an obligation as workers uh, to actually identify that and report that, so as we should for psychological risks. What's the health consequences? Mm. Michelle, you've looked at the international literature. Are people... There's really good evidence across many, many studies in the order of more than 70,000 different participants across all of these studies. Bullying is related to a whole range of mental health uh, problems for workers, from depression to anxiety, um, psychosomatic complaints like tummy problems and headaches, uh, post-traumatic stress symptoms. Um, it's, a, it's just a whole range of effects on the mental health of targets. The most serious, of course, is um, contemplating suicide or suicide attempts, and that's a really, really tragic circumstance, but a real one that can arise uh, after exposure to workplace bullying. So we're talking about a really, really serious issue here and good quality international evidence on the severe health impacts that people face um, after being exposed to bullying and also from witnessing bullying, so mm -hmm. witnesses to bullying as well. And being in that unhealthy work environment, maybe not feeling like you've got a voice to be able to speak out or that something will be done, that also creates uh, health consequences for individuals. Work cover data shows that um, bullying complaints predominantly, but any psychological health com um, claims really cost at least four times more than a physical injury claim will cost. And the recovery is four to 10 times longer for a person if they ever recover. Mm. And if, as Michelle said, the outcome isn't suicide, which unfortunately it, it sometimes is because for a person who suffers that psychological injury in a workplace, they can't see a way past that and the outcome is suicide. And so we need to make sure that, you know, we take this seriously. It costs businesses, it costs industry so much more, but it costs individuals in the workplace who are injured and then their families and their communities so much more than a physical injury. Is it fighting for the microphone here? Okay. Oh. Vicky Smith, I'm a WHS consultant um, with the LGA Workers' Comp Scheme. It's more of a comment rather than a question that we've used the analogy of physical hazards, so money handling and that sort of stuff, but bullying is really, really difficult to report. I mean, I've been bullied myself and I've stood up for people who are being bullied mm. and I've witnessed it. And so we have to acknowledge it is something that's very, very difficult because it's about relationships mm. and it's that, you know, so it's very easy to report a physical hazard, but it is very difficult to actually report somebody that's being bullying or that there's bullying actually going on and to actually deal with it. We work with councils. We put together registers for hazards. Often there's not psychological injury won't be on there. I did work for Families SA for 20 years and when we did some research on what our injuries were that was psychological, you would mm. expect that it would have been from the occupational violence that we were working with. But one of the things we sort of discovered is that it was a lot of it was to do with bullying. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the psychological injuries were coming from bullying rather than from the clients. So it's, it's more about a comment. It's, it's actually really difficult yeah. to deal with and report. And you don't want to upset your team. And so there's a whole thing. Taking that one. comment on board, yes. how, do, how do we encourage uh, people to speak out? 
So prevention is absolutely essential because it's a really good point that you make. It's yeah. such a difficult, there's a lot of stigma and fear associated with reporting about becoming the next target or things getting worse and people can put their head down and just try mm -hmm. and keep going. Um, so absolutely prevention by addressing those risks um, in the way that we've talked about. Yeah. And I'd also like to add, if we can move it upstream, if we can move those conversations upstream to prevent bullying or any other psychological injury in the first place and have it as open discussions in workplaces, just make it a normal part of what we do to talk to each other about how we will need to work, what, what do we need to do in a day together to work successfully. Because none of us go to work to be injured. Um, we, would, we go to work to do, most of us go to work to do a great job. And if we can have those supports in place and have the risks managed as they should be, then we've got a much better chance of achieving so that. Peter, so, Peter, just before we go to our next uh, question, you, in one of your conversations with me, was sort of saying so much of it's about kind of uh, not saying it he said, she said, but just mm. saying can we see, see what's needed to get this job done here mm. and identifying that. Have you got some practical yeah. advice? Well, well, yes. Look, first of all, I want to acknowledge the the comment is absolutely right. Yeah. This is a difficult area. Anything that deals with human beings and human behaviour and expectations is inherently difficult because there's no one size fits all. There are no off the shelf solutions. I absolutely understand that. There's also just to, in a sense, compound the issue is that is that there's a lot of focus on the sort of businesses that have sort of formal policies and structures and training. Um, the Australian community is essentially, business community is essentially made up of a whole series of small businesses. Mm -hmm. And of course those challenges are different and in some respects even more challenging because you don't have the infrastructure, you don't have the sort of the, the management expertise. Uh, but it's also much more difficult in a small workplace to, to raise issues. So um, yeah. you, you need slightly different solutions, but, but the, the nuanced solutions there are, are about those informal processes um, and indeed, some of the strength of small businesses is that they, because they don't formalise these things, com complaints or concerns can actually be raised in a way that's far less threatening mm -hmm. than, than it might be through a formal structure. So yeah. um, uh, it's, it's not a, it's not a no-go area, it's not something we shouldn't be dealing with, but yes, we need to realistically accept there are challenges mm -hmm. here. Hi, um, my name is Jessica, I'm from the Tourism Commission, but this is from a, a kind of almost personal level. I guess as an HR practitioner, one of the things that I face quite a lot is people asking my advice about what they should do um, in their own businesses or in their own workplaces and touching particularly on that um, uh, small businesses aspect. So um, I know of an incident, for example, where a worker has been injured um, and has gone to uh, the manager in that workplace and asked for an incident report and there's nothing uh, like an incident report and nobody has acknowledged that there's been an incident or even so much as asked that person if they were okay. Um, and my response to that of course is quite strong because it's my professional <laughs> sort of standard that that kind of thing is addressed. So I guess what I would like to know um, is what advice can I give then to who they go to and how that kind of thing is addressed because it's then a more systemic problem throughout that organisation um, and, and also going back to that manager not having any management support or training and development um, but it's not my job to kind of step in and, and do that for another business. I think you, you know, your response in relation to um, oftentimes it, it is the manager's capacity to understand people uh, oftentimes, as I said before, people are put in positions where they don't, they don't really know how to manage people. It's not one of their strengths. And unfortunately, by virtue of just their work, they get put into positions to do that. I think there are a number of resources across probably all of our websites um, that would potentially assist people to put some of those systems in place or at least have the conversations. And ultimately, it really is, if we can figure out how to communicate with each other in the workplace, what do you need to successfully do your job without an injury? And what do I need, not just from you, um, but also what do I need for myself? And sometimes, I, I heard an example the other day where um, an employer said, she said she's got a team and she, 
didn't realise that when she's challenged, she behaves in a particular way where she starts to sort of scurry around and she's hurrying and she's muttering and, and she said she didn't realise that she was actually stressing out her team until they had a conversation. And then they talked about, okay, what, what's... Because she may not realise she's starting to do this because she's going flat out, she's challenged, she's got deadlines to solve. And, and they came up with uh, an agreement that when she's like that, they, somebody will just say, just breathe. And it's simple. They don't have to come and say, you're stressing me out, you're making me feel bad, you're... It's just, just breathe, which says to her, your behaviours right at this moment in time are causing me stress. Now, that's, I appreciate that's a sort of a simplistic view, but for a lot of organisations, it just might work. For some, and, and I think these are the less frequent where people go out of their way to make people feel bad and they go out of their way, a lot of times it's just that they don't understand their own behaviours. So I think it has to come back to workplaces having those conversations. And they are, I acknowledge, really difficult conversations. I've had some of those myself with different outcomes. But uh, I think that's where we have to start, you know, particularly small businesses. If there's one message you'd like to give our audience listening online, what is it about how we design and build a bully-free workplace? Michelle? I think there needs to be a fundamental shift in how workplace bullying is viewed. Let's move away from the idea that it's a personality conflict, that it's an interpersonal problem, and let's move to the reality that it arises from the organisational system and it needs to be managed proactively in that way. I completely agree. If we move it out of a space where it's a personality conflict and look at it as a system that we can manage, we can control. If something doesn't quite work, we review it and we, can, we shift the controls. Or if we introduce something new, like it could be a new team member, again, we look at that, we have the conversations. But I think ultimately it's about every workplace having a conversation about what systems do we need. So practically, how will, what do we each need to work successfully in this organisation and ultimately, for the organisation's benefit, that I will not be injured and the organisation will be productive and efficient. And Peter? Uh, difficult area, no off-the-shelf solutions, but re really, really big payoff for workplaces, for individuals and for our society, if we can get better at this. I'd like to thank all three of you and our uh, lovely audience from Adelaide for joining us today for what I think needs to be an ongoing conversation. I know that in our conversations, the four of us have acknowledged Australia has come a long way in the last couple of decades, but we certainly, I think we do all agree, we've got a lot further to go. So thank you very much and um, I'd like to close now. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.